Hi, I'm Alec Jacobson from University of Toronto and I'll be talking about geometry processing in 2020. So I'm uh, sitting in my office in quarantine like everyone else and I really miss my lab. I'm also really grateful for video conferencing. We're able to keep doing our lab meetings over Zoom. And in fact, it's not just our lab, we're doing everything over Zoom these days. We have the SIGGRAPH PC meeting, I have faculty meetings, we've had entire conferences, uh, we also do our socializing on Zoom. I've watched improv shows uh, and even attended family events such as my sister's graduation. And that got me thinking, across our department, we must have dozens of VR headsets. But why didn't anyone want to take these VR headsets home? And I think it goes far beyond, you know, lab meetings and office events. The stakes are really high. Here's my family celebrating my grandfather's 90th birthday last summer in person. This is how I interact with my grandfather now over video chat. He's mostly alone in his house and he's doing his physical therapy over Zoom. And this isn't even the worst of what's going on in the world. People are trapped in nursing homes without any visitors at all. So it got me thinking, this could have been the big moment for immersive 3D. So my first hot take of this talk is that I claim that open challenges in 3D geometry processing are the reason why we're not actually seeing ubiquitous virtual reality. I actually think the devices that we have these days are great. They're really good. Try the Oculus Quest, it's great. And this really isn't a comment about the state of telepresence research, which is not my field. Instead, I think we still have a lot of problems in how we capture, create, and process 3D geometry. And I want to stress that this is really a personal revelation about 3D geometry's lacking role. Uh, and I see it as an enormous opportunity to connect people to other people. This is why I love doing research at SIGGRAPH, whose vision statement is enabling everyone to tell their stories. Now, a lot of the online conversations about this vision statement squabble over what the meaning of stories signals to funding agencies, but I want to sidestep that. I actually love this vision statement. It's so human and proactive. And if I allow myself to get a little melodramatic about what we mean by everyone and what we mean by stories, then I can really convince myself that this is the most important problem. If astronomers are thinking about where did we come from and physicists are thinking about what makes the world work, then we're asking how do people interact with each other and how can we change and make that interaction better? That's huge. So I'd like to talk about my journey so far and what I see ahead for us. So my research started uh, considering 2D animation. So given a shape like this, this clam uh, character, how can we deform it? How can we bring it to life? Well, one way to do that is to start with a figure on the left, draw some figure where you want it to go, and then draw all the frames in between. So instead of drawing each frame, perhaps we can provide the user with a system where they just indicate what should happen to the shape with sparse user controls. So we might lay down some points that will act as handles on top of the shape, and then the question is, if the user moves one of these handles, what should happen to the shape? If we fail to take the geometry of the shape into account, we might get something like this, where the transformation that was intended for the top of the clam bleeds into the bottom of its body. Our key observation was that we can correctly account for the geometry of the shape by propagating its influence through weighting functions over the shape. So the handle should have a weighting function of 100% near the handle and smoothly vary to zero in the region that it shouldn't influence. And we can determine these weighting functions automatically just by analyzing the shape of the character and the position of the handles. With these weighting functions, we can then simply take a weighted combination of the transformations applied to each of the handles. This is a very simple method that can then be executed on the GPU very efficiently. And this applies not just to these isolated point handles, but generalizes to other user interfaces that are common across computer graphics, like skeletons that we're using here to control the mouth of this alligator, or cages that are good for controlling volumetric regions like the belly. This deformation system has been uh, incorporated into a variety of different applications. Here you're seeing a demonstration of its implementation inside of Adobe Illustrator. What I particularly like about this implementation is that it maintains the vector graphics representation of the shape, which means that afterwards I can go in and edit the vector graphics just like I normally would on the input. 
But what I'm most excited about is how this can change human interactions. Let me show you one example. A bomb? You mean like one of these? Ah, get it away, Stephen. Get it away. What? what? Come on. This is an example where the cartoon character is interacting in real time with a person who's being uh, filmed in front of a studio audience. The motion and voice of an actor offstage are mapped to the cartoon character in real time, allowing the cartoon to react and respond uh, to the real life Stephen Colbert. The software running here is Adobe Character Animator, which recently won a technical Emmy. Uh, our work is just one minor part of this great software, and if you'd like to hear more about this, I'd encourage you to watch Will Lee's Graphics Interface 2020 keynote, which is available on YouTube. Our work in 2D also extends to 3D. Here you're seeing an example of a skeletal deformation where we're able to distill as much information as we can from the geometry, and this allows us to make an IK, inverse kinematic system, where changes in the skeleton in the top half of the character interact with the skeleton at the bottom through the geometry. This also leads to lightning fast dynamic elasticity simulation if we add a momentum term. Where previous methods measured their runtime in seconds or milliseconds, this method uh, can operate in microseconds. When working on these projects, I found that making results in 3D was really frustrating. While in 2D, I could really take any cartoon that I drew myself or some painting I found online or a photograph, in 3D, I had to work really hard to make results. And in fact, the five 3D models that we had in our paper in 2011 were really the only five models that I could manage to tetrahedralize and then run our weight computation. And part of the problem, I think, is how we approach geometry processing. Traditionally, we think of geometry processing as a pipeline made up of many substages. So we acquire or create the geometry in some way and then go through various stages of analysis and editing and finally consume that geometry in some way. Perhaps we're going to render it in VR. When things are working out really well, then we can actually realize this as a flow graph style visual programming. So here each component of the pipeline really shows up as one um, uh, node or module that we can connect to all the others. But in reality, our pipeline looks more like this. Every stage is an opportunity for loss. We might have to convert from the output representation of one stage to make it compatible as for the input of an another stage. The output might be riddled with problems that are going to throw off the next algorithm, so we might have to manually intervene and clean up problems with the data. We might get data all the way down the pipeline that then fails at almost the last minute, and we have to go back and start all over again with this uh, process. Now, it's not all gloom and doom. Some data does eventually make it into the consumption stage. This shouldn't give us a false sense of security. So how do you do research under these kind of conditions? Well, a traditional approach is to have really strict preconditions on your input. This way you can just tell the user, hey, you didn't meet the conditions that I expected, just go back and fix the problems. Once you have clean data, then you can uh, run our algorithm. And this leads me and many others uh, to finding tools that will allow us to manually fix up our data to run some algorithm. I suffered from a very similar scenario as this when I was trying to prepare models to tetrahedralize for our deformation project. There's a good side to these strict preconditions. It allows us to use representations that make a very clear connection between the smooth math that we find in differential geometry and the discrete world. The problem is when we want to build robust pipelines, and it's very difficult to do. A symptom that we can observe in the research is that we have the same 10 models appearing in lots of different geometry processing uh, papers from this era. Instead, one of the questions that I asked was whether or not we could redefine algorithms to gracefully degrade in the presence of these kind of issues. And we asked this question even for really basic things like whether or not a point is inside or outside of a given shape. This requires a robust answer when our shape suffers from all sorts of issues like non-manifold elements, overlapping components, self-intersections, and open boundaries. So given a messy shape like this, can we robustly determine an answer for insideness? We presented an approach in our paper about the generalized winding number function that defines a scalar field in space that measures a fractional value of insideness, where the value is closer to one on the interior of the shape and smoothly varies to close to zero on the outside of a shape in the presence of these issues. This allows us to guide tetrahedralization 
uh, which we can then pass on to downstream uh, algorithms such as simulation. So this allows us to go from a handful of clean models that we can use in all of our algorithms to tens of thousands of models. This was a data set called Thingy 10K that we presented first in a paper about robustly computing Boolean operations uh, for messy triangle meshes. Another great advantage of this approach is it allows us to think about how to solve problems that reach across the entire pipeline, potentially skipping steps that uh, lack robustness. Here's an example from our paper uh, extending the generalized winding number of functions to point clouds where we show how you can adapt the slicing algorithm in a 3D printer to directly take as input a point cloud. So we're skipping any triangulation or STL file that would otherwise be needed by commercial slicers. Having a way to process large amounts of data found in the wild, we can also start to ask, what can we learn from this data? I've been working on this area recently and we have a paper this year at SIGGRAPH 2020 called Neural Subdivision with colleagues at Adobe and my student Derek Liu. I'd also like to encourage you to follow Rana and Lior, who are great young researchers uh, in the field of geometric learning. You can find them on Twitter. Geometric machine learning is a really fast moving field and it often feels really hard to do slow science. I want to spend more time thinking and less time dealing with rote tasks. Over the course of my work on animation, I wrote a lot of boilerplate code, including mesh readers, converters, builders, traversals, etc. Uh, this led me and Daniele Pinozzo to design a geometry processing library with a mission. And that mission was to enable researchers to prototype ideas. This allows us to check all of our design decisions against this mission statement. And in doing so, we can emphasize replicability and open sourceness over developing one major killer app or, or necessarily supporting commercial applications. I see the uh, possibility of open source software uh, continuing in computer graphics as one that could lead to really exponential changes in our field. And I would encourage you to take a look at the code replicability and computer graphics paper that will be presented at SIGGRAPH 2020. So I'm feeling a lot of momentum at this point in my career, and then 2020 happened. And I'm wondering, what should my priorities be? What should our priorities be in our field? So I'd like to propose that digital 3D geometry could have a major role in human expression, and I see this as something that permeates through art, industrial design, medicine, and basic communication between people. As evidence that we have a long way to go, we can look toward the 2D world, where even self-described poor drawers will reach for pen and paper when describing an event, uh, such as maybe a nurse describing a procedure to a patient, or someone describing a car crash to their insurance agent, or a friend describing the uh, renovations that they're doing on their kitchen. The idea that in any of these scenarios, someone would reach for 3D modeling software feels almost absurd. Yet we exist in 3D. Matching the dimensionality of our expression to our experience could be transformative across all walks of life. We have some glimpses at what this could look like. I'll point to one example, the work done by the Forensic Architecture.org uh, collective of artists, architects, and journalists who have uh, used 3D modeling software uh, to reconstruct controversial events such as police killing of civilians. Amazing output devices such as virtual reality headsets or 3D printers already exist, but most people lack the desire to actually own or use one of these. Better geometry processing could lead to reasons why people should care about integrating these technologies into the way that we communicate with each other. There are so many people that I would like to thank that have helped me throughout my career and co-authored papers with me. I'd like to call out especially my advisors, Dennis, Olga, and Eitan, and my close collaborators, Daniele, Dave, Ilya, Jovan, and Yotam. A special thank you to my students and the DGP lab at University of Toronto. And I'd like to give a heartfelt thank you to the Canadian computer graphics community. When I joined University of Toronto, I got a warm welcome from researchers all across Canada, and it's been a great experience so far. Finally, I'd like to thank my wife, Annie Yetterberg. She's been an amazing supporter. She's moved across the world with me, um, and I'm so happy to have her in my life. Thank you, Annie.